Okay. Hey guys, how's it going? Savannah, welcome hey, back. That's was... um, good. Bright and early here in Seattle, but I've got sunlight outside today. So I love doing these things in the summer. Oh, wow. That's yeah. uh, that's impressive. I mean, I saw like a TikTok the other day that was something like when it's like when you're getting ready for um, summer in Seattle and then it just rains. <laughs> yep. No, that's the thing. <laughs> that's absolutely true. It never does Sorry. it. And how are you doing, Connor? Where are you again? Good. How are you? I, I'm based out of uh, Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. So uh, thanks for having me on today. Excited to yeah, be here. looking forward to our chats to get into some savings plan stuff we're going to get into. Um, and before anybody asks, it's fun to notice this on a call the other day. I do have a little fan going. So if my hair's wisping and moving around, <laughs> it's because it's super hot in the UK and I'm dying. Uh, but yeah, all right, let's let's um, let's get into it. So welcome everyone to the Keys to AWS Optimization, the show where we share stories, concepts, and solutions to help you unlock your spend at AWS. My name is Stephanie Gooch, and I am a commercial architect at AWS, and I have two amazing guests with me today. One you will be seeing a lot more of as she's going to be joining as one of our rotating hosts, which is Savannah. Hey, Savannah. Do you want to just do your title as an intro? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Savannah Jensen. I am a customer enablement specialist here at AWS, and I've been around for about four and a half, going on five years now. Um, <laughs> I'm in billing and kind of cost the entire time. And before that, I worked in healthcare software. Nice. And then Connor, first time on the show. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. No, it's great to be here. Do you want to do your kind of one minute origin story as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, everyone. My name is Connor Murphy. Uh, similar to Savannah, I'm also a customer enablement specialist here at AWS. I've been with AWS for a little over a year, about 13 months now. Um, whole time within this role, right? So very focused on FinOps and billing. Um, Prior to AWS, I was actually kind of had two two different roles. First one in supply chain, and the, the uh, second in finance. So I always had more of a financial background, and uh, you know, happy to kind of use that background to help customers save some money here. Awesome. Okay, and today this is going to be this is very timely. This conversation. Well, it's it's always timely. Mainly, one of my maybe they're watching. One of my customers just mentioned this in the call. Um, we're going to be talking about savings plan purchase strategy um, and ROIs, um, but you know, ROIs, um, and so. We, this is really exciting because customers come, especially to like Savannah and um, Connor all the time, and even mm -hmm. to, to me to ask what the best practices are when it comes to purchasing them. And Savannah, do you want to, we talked about this the other day, do you want to kind of explain how we led into this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the questions that we get semi-constantly when a customer is going through either the first process of buying some kind of lease-based savings product, either a savings plan or an RI, or even if they're kind of rethinking their strategy and doing a renewal is where do we purchase these things? We purchase them in a linked account, in a pair account, what's the best practice here? What strategy should I go with? And unfortunately, there's not one magic solution for everyone. <laughs> there's not a right answer, but there probably is a right answer for your business. So we're here today to kind of talk through um, kind of the, the pros and cons of each, what you should be thinking about when you make this decision um, and how to really conceptualize how to move through these decisions as you kind of go along this journey. Great. And I think, so as always, um, please feel free to put any comments, questions in the chat. These guys work with savings plans all the time, probably far too much. Um, and uh, <laughs> I can answer any, any of your questions. But of course, if we can't answer them today, you can always email us at costoptimization at amazon.com any questions in general um okay so do we want to get into you've already kind of said it uh Savannah, that there is no <laughs> perfect setup for this there isn't just like okay we're going to present a slide being like this is the strategy because it just mm -hmm. depends on your business which is a big part of it so we were thinking about going through um a couple of like pros and cons for the different methods, but do you want to outline either one of you what the kind of main considerations are before you start with this kind of stuff? Connor, you can go for it if you'd want to. Yeah, absolutely. Start. So a, a lot of times it's going to depend, as Savannah mentioned, kind of on, on the business use case for what you're trying to cover. Uh, you know, I've worked with some customers who really want to cover specific workloads, other customers who just want to kind of blanket cover their compute across, you know, a number of different linked accounts. So really it's kind of almost an investigation an investigation, uh, that, that initial conversation to understand what are we trying to accomplish here? And then we can kind of move forward that way. Um, uh, and then really, I think there's kind of three different options. I think Savannah, we talked about, right? Payer level, linked account level, and then a blend. So really depending on what you're trying to accomplish with your purchases is going to depend on really what's going to work the best for you. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is all kind of predicated on the fact that any savings product, an RI or a savings plan is going to have affinity for the account that it lives in. Um, if you have sharing on within your billing family, once it kind of does everything it can do in that account, it's going to look across the rest of your organization for opportunities to apply. Um, but it will always look to that account that it lives in first. So where you purchase them, which account you purchase them in, does have a pretty direct application on where they apply and where you see that benefit. Um, so you can kind of leverage that in a couple different ways to do a couple different things for your business, basically. Mm -hmm. That is a great shout out because that is one of those things where people always question about where they buy it, how is it going to work on their calculations. Mm -hmm. And this is why a lot of the time when you hear us talk about the labs, we often mention having a separate kind of cost account that you deploy infrastructure into. Absolutely. Or, you know, mm -hmm. Deploy things in your player account um, because <laughs> it will kind of think about it like attacking that service if you're saving. If you have a very small like tiny old uh i don't know t2 small or something in your account the savings fund will try and approach that first in the account you paid for if you're in the payer and then go off into your other account so to give you the max saving have no kind of nothing for it to go to in those accounts awesome okay yep. cool so also just before we get into pros and cons who um this is kind of a road question but <laughs> who are you guys maybe Savannah, take this um when you're talking to these people in the in kind of a customer situation, who are the people that need to know about this? Who should be listening to this today? Um, this Twitch episode, or who should be listening in on the conversation? <laughs> this Twitch, like this Twitch. <laughs> okay. Anybody who is purchasing an RI or a savings plan should be thinking about this and could benefit from this information. But also anybody who works in an account that needs to think about where these things happen as well. So your hands-on keyboard developers can also benefit from this information. Even if they're not the ones clicking purchase, it's still helpful to know where these things apply, how they apply, and what strategy your organization is doing. The reason for that is especially if you are using one of those cost accounts, like Steph, Steph mentioned, um, if everything's kind of in that one account and you have a separate linked account that's got a changing workload, you might see that coverage change month over month. So you might see your costs kind of fluctuate in a way that you don't really understand. Um, if there is kind of a certain coverage level coming from that account that's a little bit borderline, or if you're kind of spinning up and spinning down instances that are a little bit more or less expensive. So even if you are getting kind of chargebacks that even all of that out, you might look at your billing tools and be a little bit confused. So it's good to be aware of it, even if you're not the one who's physically taking action on these things. Perfect. Okay, so should we start with purchasing at the payer level and go through a couple of pros and cons? Connor, do you want to totally. start with uh, a pro? Perfect. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think really kind of the main pro that we see with purchasing at the payer level is it's easy to essentially manage everything, right? You can just have one team who kind of is looking across your entire compute portfolio, making one purchase. There they can track utilization, savings, all the different metrics on the savings plans or RIs. So really it's kind of a one-stop shop. While you can't guarantee exactly what it's going to apply to, it's just a little bit easier to manage than kind of that bespoke option at the linked account levels. Cool, cool. So that overarching view is very good. All right, I'm going to let you guys, yeah, just, just free flow <laughs> now. Uh, we're going to, this is, there's no plan just to like shoot, tell us, <laughs> educate me, tell me that the pros and cons. Yeah. Are yeah, absolutely. So with a savings plan, specifically a compute savings plan, the other really big pro of purchasing at the payer account level or in a cost account, if there's nothing else running in that account, effectively it works the same way, um, is those compute savings plans are designed to apply in a way that saves you the most money. So they are going to look across all of your usage at the payer level and find what's going to save you the most money, find the highest savings percent, cover that first and then continue down until there's nothing left to cover or until they're kind of out of savings plan benefit. So if they're purchased at the linked account level because of that affinity, they're going to do that in the account that they live in first and then look elsewhere, which can end up saving you less overall because there could be instances out there in the payer or in the organization that are more expensive and would save you more than are in that linked account. So if you're thinking about a compute savings plan, we always highly recommend to purchase that at the payer level to maximize your savings. There are some maybe chargeback related or governance things that would encourage you to do otherwise if you have a different business need. But if you're trying to optimize every single nickel that you're saving, the payer is going to be the best bet there. Uh, getting the most bang for your buck. 
that Absolutely. top Definitely. that top level. Definitely. Okay, talking about kind of seeing those savings, Connor, how does it work with things like the native billing tools when it comes to purchasing at the payer level? Yeah, absolutely. So at the payer level, it's going to be really straightforward. If you, if you have payer access and you're making a purchase there, you'll be able to see kind of across the board, across all your different linked accounts, who's getting benefit of them, what that benefit is, what the savings are per linked account. However, if you want to kind of hide some of those um, some of those details to your different linked accounts, if not everyone has access, you can do that too. So th this one you can kind of think of as a pro and a con in terms of how much detail is going to be shared with the linked account. Um, but it's really easy to kind of just leverage the native billing tools like you're mentioning. Cost Explorer is a great way to do it. Just kind of go in. Just when you purchase a savings plan, you can see your utilization and coverage reports all from the same console. Nice and easy. Just have that kind of top Exactly. exactly. Okay. One-stop shop. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And so, okay, there's some great points. So great cons. You get the most saving. You can see a lot. Everyone can kind of filter out different accounts. Any other cons? A pro, sorry? Um, really, when it comes to repurchasing, and we kind of covered this a little bit in the in the mm -hmm. governance piece and central management thing as well. But when you're up for renewal or when that savings plan is kind of coming to its end, um, you only have to log into the payer account to do it. You can do it all in a couple clicks. You don't have to log into multiple linked accounts to make these purchases. It's really a lot simpler in terms of the administrative work you have to do to mm -hmm. renew or transact a new purchase. So. Yeah, definitely. And I just thought maybe, uh, maybe we thought this one, but thinking of it from uh, a managing point of view, you kind of know where your big spends are to come. So if you are a yeah. company that are sure. always doing like all upfront commits, then if you have your singular payer account and then you do your all upfront, you know to tell kind of finance or procurement or your stakeholder, somebody who cares about the bill, that this is going to happen in this month. Whereas if they're dotted all over the place, you'll be like, okay, this is the ones I can see, but then you have 10 other ones going to happen at the same time. So it might be a bit of a, a bill shock situation. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Let's think about those cons then. What are the challenges? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Connor. So, uh, all right, I'll start with this one. So in my opinion, I think one of the biggest challenges that we see here is you really don't have any control in terms of where they're going to apply. As Savannah mentioned, this can be a pro because it's going to maximize savings. But sometimes when teams have you know specific budgets set aside for specific applications or linked accounts, you know purchasing at the payer level might not be your best option because it's going to go and provide that highest discount first. When Steph, I think the uh, kind of example you used where say you're just running a bunch of T2 micros and you just want to cover them, maybe this isn't going to be your best option and it might be better to look at the linked account level instead of payer. So that's kind mm -hmm. of one of the main main cons that we see from customers and something that we'd kind of uh, maybe suggest some workarounds to, to address. Mm -hmm. In the same vein too, if you have a large organization with a lot of different business units and you've kind of purchased something to cover multiple sections of that, um, and suddenly someone somewhere spins something down and you see a bunch of underutilization all of a sudden, it can be a little bit of a challenge to figure out exactly what happened to cause that. You can pull it out of the billing data, but it's a little bit more arduous than if it was just purchased in the linked account because then you can immediately see, okay, this RI lives in this linked account, this savings plan lives in this linked account. This is the kind of business unit who spun something down without communicating first. So. You have given me a flashback to that <laughs> happening where I was just like, oh, I've been taken back to my old job where literally we were like fine on the utilization and then one day we were not fine and it was very <laughs> low. And I was like, what has happened? And it's because we'd, we'd bought, like, I think it was like C something. And so mm. like C4s or something and it dropped and someone was like, oh, we eventually, like you said, we worked through the bill. We were like, okay, it was in this account last month. Like mm. what's happened? And then they change and I was like, no, 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 no. You need to go back. And they're like, oh, but they were over provision. And I was like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like we the saving was too big like you need to go back so yeah that please modernize big. just not right now thanks yeah, please check. yeah. but then that, that becomes like a very big challenge especially when it comes to more restrictive things that's more for ris i guess when we were doing <laughs> that we, it was before savings mm -hmm. time and that is probably a restriction with the ris was we were very like okay it has to be this this instance type and they were the only yep. account doing it but they had so many that we were like oh yeah it'd be fine when you look at that report across like 300 accounts you're like oh i have 20 if i buy a couple it'd be fine but yeah it was a big mm. one um do you know what? while we're talking about our and savings plans let's bring up a couple yeah. of questions that we've had in the chat um so let me pull this one up all right how do you think about the differences pros cons between ris and savings plans both compute and ec2 
and how customers can ensure they're taking full advantage of their purchases. So we've done episodes before about RS and savings plans, um, just to mm. caveat, but get, get, we want to we always want to help everybody. So yeah, what do you think in a summary, uh, both of you can can kind of join in on this, um, are the yeah. best ways to take advantage. Connor, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say in majority of cases, I would definitely recommend savings plans to cover your EC2 and compute resources over RIs. There are a few examples, and I'll get into them when that might not be the case. But just at a very high level, in most cases, right, RIs and savings plans are going to give you the same discount, whether it's compute um, savings plans giving you the same discount as kind of your convertible RIs or EC2 instant savings plans giving you the same discount as your standard RIs. There are some slight um, kind of caveats to that with SUS in base instances, but for the most part, that's going to kind of be sweeping. The one time where it might be, you know, a little advantageous to leverage an RI over a savings plan is when you really need to nail down what you want it to apply to, right? Because the RIs are going to be a little bit more restrictive and you say you only want to cover specific instances in a specific region, maybe an RI might be your best bet there. But um, uh, for the majority of cases, I, I really kind of rarely see that to, to be the case. So I'd, for, for the most part, recommend starting with savings plans. And then if we need to kind of filter down, we can leverage RIs as well. Uh, Savannah, I'm not sure if you have a, uh, you know, maybe different different situations. Yeah, absolutely. Plus one to everything that you just said, Connor. Um, the kind of primary benefit of a savings plan, either an instant savings plan or a compute savings plan, is they were inherently designed to be a more flexible product. They have a lot more flexibility than the RI option. That's why we came out with them because we'd gotten a lot of feedback about how difficult RIs were to manage and how much flexibility people wanted that wasn't there. So if you have any questions about what's going to happen to your workload, whether it's going to change regions, instance families, whatever it is, a compute savings plan is always going to be a better choice over a convertible RI because it's going to take care of those conversions for you instead of you having to go into the console and physically tinker with it. Um, in terms of when to choose what and when RIs are maybe a, a better option, I don't know if I would say from a technical perspective that they're ever really kind of like a, a much, much better option. But I will say we see a lot that it's the mindset um, and kind of conceptualizing it that makes people choose RIs over savings plans because it's it's fairly easy to conceptualize three instances, right? You're spinning up three instances. If you're coming from an on-prem world, that was three servers in a data center somewhere, right? That That count is something that everybody is very familiar with and very comfortable with. With a savings plan, you're thinking about a dollar per hour commit, um, which can be a little bit harder to wrap your brain around initially. It's still kind of, it's intuitive once you get the hang of it, but doing that work to get the hang of it is not always something that kind of everybody in an organization is able to do or wants to do, so. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't, I kind of forgotten because we just talk about RIs and savings plans all the time that, yeah, that, that people do like that, like, okay, I'm going to buy like three apples is different to like a percentage of one. Uh, people like to do different ones. Um, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, guys. Got, uh, we'll throw another one as well. Um, here we go. All right. How will my savings plans interact with any EC2 RIs that are active in my account? Oh, it's about to be touched by that question. <laughs> I'm just loving the username. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, whoever wants to take this one. Yes, Ben, you want to start with this one? I know we kind of chatted about this. Well, yeah, really absolutely. So the short answer is they work exactly how you want them to. Um, they kind of stack in the intuitive direction. They go from most specific to most general. So if you've got a standard RI, standard zonal RI, let's say, that's kind of as specific as we get, that's going to look for coverage or look for usage to apply to first. And then it will continue kind of up the stack until we get to compute savings plans, which are the least specific. So you can run both simultaneously. You can have both in your environment simultaneously. They are built to kind of exist in parity. So you don't have to worry about that. And for the most part, they apply in exactly the order that you'd expect them to. Awesome. Cool. All right. So let's jump back to our, our main kind of chat about the strategy. And I want to touch back on something Savannah, you said earlier, which was um, about chargeback. So when we're still focusing on purchasing at a payer account, uh, what's, does that make chargeback any easier, harder, or what do you think? So generally speaking, it makes it a little bit harder because if you purchase either of these products in those linked accounts, let's say you've 
gone with a no upfront option, that recurring fee is going to hit the linked account that it lives in. If you're purchasing everything at the payer level and you have nothing running in any of the linked accounts, that entire recurring fee is going to hit the payer. So if you're just looking at the bill and you haven't done any allocation, the question is, hey, the payer is not running anything. Why am I getting all these charges and what do I do with them? And there are a couple of ways to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of proportionally distribute it all the way across your organization. If your coverage is sitting at 100%, that might make sense. 90% um, of the time, your coverage is not going to be sitting at 100%. So you have to do a little bit of thinking about how you want to push those recurring charges down um, based on consumption. There are a couple of views in Cost Explorer that you can use to do that. Um, we've got a couple, I believe, queries in the well-architected labs that help with that as well. Uh, but you do definitely want to think about kind of what's going to happen when you get the bill at the end of the month when you start purchasing. Um, because what we don't want to happen is you make these purchases and then you get your bill and you're like, oh, no, <laughs> how do I how do I reallocate this to my business units based on who's consuming what? And how do I pass these savings around in a way that's fair to everyone and makes the most sense? Connor, have you seen any way these customers have done this, like any specific choices they have made? Um, about this allocation of costs? Yeah, definitely. A, a couple that I've worked with really, I think to Savannah's kind of latter point there, really focus more on which linked accounts or which accounts are actually using the, the savings plan. Uh, very, very rarely have I seen kind of a, a peanut butter spread approach where you're just going to allocate even even batches across your organization. For the most part, it's, um, as Savannah mentioned, kind of leveraging costs and usage reports um, in order to understand, okay, out of all my different accounts, he used the majority of the savings plan, you know, maybe one account used 95% and the remaining five only got spread through the rest and you want to charge back accordingly. So that, that's what I see happen for the most part. And then what, what I also found kind of interesting is I've seen customers actually change up their chargeback model depending on their purchase option. So for example, if a customer with an all upfront purchase in the savings plan, they're just going to make the account that made that purchase kind of absorb the cost there. But anything else that's more recurring, they're going to then spread out evenly. So really it's going to kind of depend on the customer and kind of finance how they want to account for it but definitely kind of mostly see the the um, spread out by usage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think last time we, when I was doing it before, we would kind of absorb the idle uh, RSA. The yeah. yeah, so it's going to do it. Uh, or I think we do, or some customers like will redistribute it across everyone. So it's kind of just mm. like a fair, like it's because mm. it's, it's normally not that much. So it's just like a little bit um, across the board. Um, no, definitely. Awesome. Um, here we go. Let's throw this one up as well, and then we will dive into the the last bit of the talk. So, do you ever see customers purchase both at the payer and linked account level to maximize savings? I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, Savannah, do you want to jump on that? Yeah, the answer is constantly. Um, most of the folks that we work with eventually, in some capacity or another, end up with a blended strategy here or there. Um, so the thing that I see most often is we've got maybe a couple business units who have really strict budgets and really need to make sure that their workloads are covered. In those cases, um, we purchase in those linked accounts, either an RI or a savings plan, depending on their preference, to cover those workloads first, and then purchase some sort of gap fill at the payer or cover the rest of the organization at the payer level as well. Um, depending on kind of how tight your governance is, how engaged your business units are, and how much feedback you can get from folks. Um, sometimes we see people purchase at the linked account level kind of across the board and then put some gap fill in the form of a compute savings plan at the payer level to kind of take care of the extra as people like flux up and down throughout the month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think to piggyback on that, Savannah, I, I think this kind of strategy is super helpful because a lot of the times what I've seen is the linked accounts are going to be much closer to the actual instances running. So they might be mm -hmm. able to leverage, you know, a more specific or EC2 instance savings plan to drive, you know, additional savings over standard compute. Um, mm -hmm. And then to your point, you kind of layer in at the pair level. So um, to be honest, I, I think in my opinion, depending on the use case, this is probably one of the better approaches that you can take. Yeah, yeah. it also encourages folks to have a little bit more ownership over their own cost savings too. Mm -hmm. If you kind of put out that message throughout your organization, like, hey, what do you want to purchase at your linked account? Let's give you permissions to actually complete the purchase. We'll all go in and do it together on the same day or something like mm -hmm. that. It makes everybody who's physically doing the technical work understand how this kind of plays out and then they can yeah. track their savings and see that over the course of the term, which encourages a little bit more cost awareness generally. Which is what we want. We want everyone to know what's yeah. going on. Uh, I just want to shout out as well, 
this um, this comment from this user. Nick, I'm glad you're hooked. We're all talking about talking about savings plans, which is something you could buy uh, to help save money on your compute commit at AWS. So I'm glad you're enjoying the show. Hope you'll see you again next time. Um, cool. So we kind of overlapped on it. Uh, we kind of spoke about the last subject we we're going to talk about, which was uh, a bit of both. But is there anything we've missed about um, why it's a pro to just buy at the linked account level? Um, really, the, like making your chargebacks easier is the primary thing that I see because, again, those recurring charges are going to hit the linked account. Um, in terms of kind of the other side of it, it is a lot more difficult to manage. And depending on kind of how engaged your organization is, how much feedback you can get from each business unit, and how much ownership and how much time everybody who's kind of in AWS every day has to think about these things and make these purchases it can be a little bit hard to herd all the cats and get everything in a good spot. You're also at risk for folks kind of renewing on whatever cadence they want. So if you have people buying these things kind of arbitrarily every two weeks, it's going to be a lot harder to manage those expirations. And it's also a lot harder for them to remember when they have to go in and renew. So we are more likely to run into situations where suddenly your coverage drops and you're like, what happened? Um, mm -hmm. And then you as governance have to go chase someone and say, hey, your RI is expired. Can you repurchase those, please? Thanks. And then it's funny, so many bring that up because I've also seen kind of the opposite where a linked account might go in and just say, I need to cover 100% of everything, mm -hmm. then go through some, you know, right sizing, terminating idle instances. And then next thing you know, they bought too much of a savings plan and are over provisioned. So I think that's, you know, a really good point for both sides. Yeah, the 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 weighing up, and you see why customers always ask us this question because it's a uh, it's complicated. Like we said at the start, there's lots of different things to to think about. Uh, we've got another question. I'm going to pop up. Uh, here we go. So, any tips on partial upfront compute savings plans, amortization, and chargeback from master payer account? Yeah, do we have this in the labs? Because we do have those fields in the cost and usage report, so you can. Mm kind of pull the the data about either how much upfront payment you have associated with that lease with the RI fee line item for each, mm. or if it's an RI for the RI fee line item um, in the savings plan, it's in a different spot. Um, and then either amortize it yourself or take one of the calculated amortized values that's already in the car and use it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm digging and through, I think... I find one. <laughs> Mine's trying to, so bad. to remember <laughs> if that's in the lab or not. It's in uh, the queries in the cost intelligence dashboard. Sorry, Connor, go for it. No, I was going to say, uh, I've definitely done it. I think it's, what is it, like savings plan recurring fee, something like that. But anyways, the way that I've seen this done, obviously, it's going to depend customer to customer. But I think we touched about on this on like chargeback models is just like, you know, you can absolutely separate the recurring fee from the all upfront fee uh, or partial upfront fee. And then it just depends on how you want to allocate it or amortize it across. But there's absolutely, mm -hmm. with leveraging the cost and support, um, easy way to do it. Yeah, I think, oh my God, my internet is so bad today um, it, that I can't find it, uh, but I will find it and I will put it on the show notes. So yeah, as a reminder, we all these videos go up on YouTube, um, so you can follow us on the Key Service Optimization on YouTube and comment, like, subscribe, all that jazz if you're watching on there, uh, and I will post the, the link to there as well. Okay, last two minutes. Oh, here we go. We've got one more question that we'll be able to fit in there. So is there a mm. threshold for which you recommend for savings plan coverage? Oh, good question. Another loaded question that we yeah. get all the time. <laughs> exactly. All right, you got two minutes, quick summary. <laughs> What's to cover? Hannah, you want to start? Yeah, sure, I'll start here. Um, so, so you'll hate the answer, but it, it depends, right? It totally is going to depend on kind of what you have going on in your account. Um, a lot of times we'll see customers and definitely recommend start small, right? Get a couple quick wins, particularly if you're just starting with savings plans and then you can build your portfolio and start to see kind of your coverage increase. Um, in terms of a number, I'd rarely give a number because it's going to depend on what you have going on in your um, account. You want to leverage spot. So you, maybe you're going to want to have your coverage a little bit lower than others. If everything's super steady, you know, you're not going to change anything and you can't run the risk of leveraging spot. Maybe you could have a higher coverage level, right? But in my opinion, instead of giving a, a hard and fast answer, it would be better to have a conversation with, you know, someone from AWS or whoever you're working with here to get a better understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. And then we could kind of tailor make a uh, coverage plan for you. Mm -hmm. Anything Absolutely. to add, 
Yeah, I mean, it's going to depend so much on what you're doing on AWS and what your workload looks like. And it's it can be normal for that to vary month over month. If you're a mm -hmm. game studio and you're launching something massive, you're going to have a crazy usage spike. If you want to cover all of that, you're at risk of underutilization the rest of the year. So that's mm -hmm. not a great thing to plan for. Um, if you have a completely steady, consistent workload, maybe you can cover it at 100% with, without kind of much concern there. Um, but it's really important to think about both what your workload looks like and what you're trying to do. If you're trying to modernize and move everything to containers within the next year, that's another thing to consider. Is there any kind of technical architectural change going on that would impact this? Lots of factors, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, I think, the summary of today's episode. It just depends. All right, brilliant. Thank you so much, guys, for joining. I really hope everyone enjoyed. Great questions today. Every week we're here. Please come bring questions. Uh, next week, we've got ASG coming on to talk with their CTO. So come join us here next week. And uh, we'll see you all then. Thanks, guys. Awesome.